girls, grab your beer. Hey everybody, this is Charlie from Anthrax, and you are listening to Today's Food Doggle. This is Mark Metcalf, and you are listening to Today's Food Doggle with Bailey on Domain Cleveland Radio. You are listening to Today's Food Doggle with Bailey on Domain Cleveland Radio. Yes, Kato Kalen listens to this all the time. What's going on, everybody? It's Bill Bailey with today's Boondoggle. And a real quick housekeeping note, if you're watching us on YouTube or Rumble or BitChute or Odyssey, uh, please hit that follow and subscribe button. And if you're listening to us on Spotify, Apple, Google, uh, whatever podcast platform you utilize, please hit that follow and subscribe button so we can continue to bring you conversations like the one I'm bringing you today. We are speaking with uh, Bob James from the band Silent Theory. What's going on, Bob? Uh, not much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, it, it, I've been really getting into your guys' stuff uh, um, and was looking forward to to having this conversation. Uh, you guys have been killing it this year. and um, But before I get into that, usually when I have somebody on for the first time, I like to uh, get a quick background. So do you remember originally what you wanted to be when you grew up? Ooh, that's tough. Um you know, I think because like I come from a background of like military people. Um, and so like that was always kind of on my my deck of cards was like I just assumed I'd be, you know, my dad was in submarines. Um, so I always liked the idea of that. But my grandfather was in the Marines in World War II. And I had, you know, all kinds of people on my mom's side that were, you know, in Vietnam and all kinds of stuff. So, um, yeah, I think military was always kind of part of the plan. And then after that, I hadn't really figured it out. Nice. Wow. Well, it's uh, ironic because my dad was uh, in uh, in the Marines in World War II in the invasion of Okinawa, and uh, I ended up joining the Navy. I didn't get on submarines, but I was on an aircraft carrier. Very so, cool. Um, I don't know how those submarine guys do it, man, but, uh, you know, mad, mad props to your old man. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and then what was it that, uh, um, like, you got into music and who were some of your early influences? Yeah. Um, I mean, music has always been a part of my life. Like it's always been something that I've been drawn to. Um, and I was, I like to think of myself as pretty blessed in the sense that like my mom listened to like very much like 50s, 60s, like that kind of stuff. Uh, my dad was a lot more into anything from like Phil Collins to uh, Led Zeppelin and, you know, one of his favorite bands is ACDC. So like I always kind of had that, that heavier kind of side to things. And then, you know, I just, you know, bounced around between everything in between that. And uh, so like the Beatles have always been really huge for me. And like kind of that era of music where like everybody sang harmonies were everything. Like it was just the song writing may have been a little bit more simplistic, but like, I don't know, just the, the quality and the group effort was always cool to me. But um you know, kind of in my, my formative years, like junior high, high school and stuff like that, when I really started getting into playing like rock music, um, I was listening to a really weird mix of everything from like Metallica to like Blink-182 and like stuff like that. And I don't know, I just, I've always been such a appreciator of music that like I look at some bands like Metallica and I'm like, you know, just their, their technicality and the songwriting and stuff like that is so incredible. But then you look at bands like Blink-182 and some of those pop punk bands, and it's like, 
they weren't necessarily the greatest guitar players. They weren't like trying to like be virtuosos, but like their energy on stage and just like everything they put into it, like whether it was silly or not, was always like a hundred percent. So, um, yeah, I mean, I really looked to a lot of that kind of stuff. I just kind of like picked a little things of influence out of all of that. Nice. And then, uh, when you started like, uh, getting into like learning, uh, you know, getting into music yourself and playing and performing, what was like the, uh, did you have any like local influences or what was the scene like? Um, kind of. So I grew up in a town called Bremerton, which is um, a little outside of Seattle, um, kind of across the, the Puget Sound there. And, you know, I am a little bit older than some of your listeners may be, but, um, you know, I was definitely like not old enough to really appreciate like the grunge scene, but like I definitely like, remember a lot of that and remember experiencing a lot of that um and it wasn't until much later that i really like kind of appreciated what their stamp on music history was um but other than that like there wasn't at least to my knowledge like there wasn't a huge like rock scene or anything like that in bremerton um a lot of it when i was growing up was a lot more hip-hop and that kind of stuff nice okay and then when you got uh you know, when did, uh, like silent theory come together for you and, uh, you know, where did you guys start originally playing? Yeah. So when I moved out to the Moscow Pullman area, so like <clears throat> now I live in a town, well, roughly in a town called Pullman, which is basically on the, uh, Idaho Washington border and like university of Washington's here and university of Idaho's in Moscow. And so it's kind of a weird like area. And the first guy that I met when I moved out here was Mitch, uh, who's our drummer. And we were working together at an oil change place and taking it not even remotely serious. Uh, you start hanging out a lot, start drinking, talking music and stuff. And he was playing in a band and they didn't have a bass player. And at the time, that's really what my primary instrument was. And so I ended up playing with him in that group. And over the years, we brought in Scott, who's now our lead guitar player. And that all got to a spot where we were just like, felt like we had hit kind of the end of that, that project, like it's, it's life cycle would run its course. And so we ended up like, uh, the three of us and our singer at the time stepped away from that project. And, you know, we kind of had that long, tough conversation of like, do we want to keep doing this? Like, what does the future look like for us musically? And so we decided we did want to keep doing it. And we, um, sat around for several hours in a Mexican food restaurant and had many, many margaritas kind of talking about like, what the future could look like and what names and stuff like that. And somewhere we have a notebook of just so many, some of them are really good. Some of them are really terrible. Just like name ideas that were thrown out and we <clears throat> somebody thrown out and was like, Oh, that's not too bad. And we kind of look it up and just be like, Oh, there's 37 of those bands. And we're like, okay, uh, well, what about this one? It's like, ah, that one's not very good. And stuff. So when we finally, I don't remember who it was, but somebody said something about silent theory and we're like, Hmm. And we kind of kept circling back to it. And we're like, well, how about this? We have, our first like show coming up, we'll play the show silent theory and then kind of see how we feel about it and then maybe change it before we get too deep. And, you know, that was November 2009 that we played our first show. So, you know, it's, it's stuck it's <laughs> very much part of us now. Yeah. And it, you know, it, it seems to be uh, doing well for you guys. And then, uh, but uh, ha have you guys ever like, you know, as things have blown up and you've been hitting out on, you know, getting out on the road and, uh, playing in, in other towns, do you ever get any hate like for, for being from Moscow? And then you guys are like, no, no, Idaho, Idaho, man. <laughs> um, surprisingly, no. Um, that has always been something that people are wildly fascinated with. They're like, so you're from Idaho. Like, is there a lot of music out there? It's like, no, not, not really. Most people have to travel <laughs> to get to it. Like Boise's got an okay scene. Um, there's some really cool venues and stuff down there, but we're up kind of closer to Coeur d'Alene. And so it's just like, nah, there's a lot of country music and a lot of like, you know, house EDM type stuff, but not a lot of like musicians playing instruments kind of music. Yeah, so, dude, I, I absolutely love Idaho. I, uh, was able to go out there for this, uh, after I got out of, uh, the military, there's this, uh, organization called higher ground up there and they operate up in sun Valley. Oh, and, yeah. um, yeah, they brought us out there. I got to do like horseback riding in the Sawtooth Mountains and fly fish and stuff. And it was yeah, like part of like recreational therapy. 
and it was it, it was amazing man it's like my energy and everything felt felt so much better so i definitely uh love to make the trip out there everybody like you know wants to make jokes about potatoes and stuff like that but i didn't see any potatoes when i was out there i just seen a lot of beautiful land and like yeah. i said drinking straight out of the out of the spring out of the mountain and everything yeah it's it's pretty uh, incredible and then um like as you guys have been you know starting silent theory and you said you know kind of pop, bouncing the name around uh you know at the at what was it? The, uh, the Mexican restaurant. Uh, what, uh, you know, uh, what were some of the, like, you know, getting out of there, what were some of the things that you guys were like doing as, as to kind of get noticed, to get your name out? And then when did you notice that? Uh, I mean, when did, when did like the big, did, did, did you guys get like the notice to get like touring past, you know, outside of uh, Idaho. Yeah, it was, I mean, it, it's honestly been a pretty long grind for us. Um, partially, you know, just young guys at the time who didn't know much about what we were doing and kind of figuring out as we went. And then we also have had the pleasure of working with people who've been somewhat helpful, but also very unhelpful. So, you know, it's a, it's a very common story, I feel like. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was just a lot of like, just playing as many shows as we could in the beginning. Um, trying to write songs because we really wanted to record an album. Um, and we ended up doing that. And then we did our first tour out of the area. Oh, it was summer of 2011, I think, 2012, something like that. Um, and it was it was a really great opportunity. It was very eye-opening. Um, we got paired up with a band who had just been signed to like a Warner distribution deal, which like they were selling is like we got signed to warner records and it's like well oh, it's it's not nothing but it's not the same like <laughs> distribution yeah. deals are a little bit different than like actually being a full label artist um but that was that was kind of the selling point for the tour was like that was going to be the draw and it you know we had some really good shows on that tour but we played a lot to absolutely nobody um but it was a great opportunity to get out we you know did most of that in like the the upper midwest area and it was just it was so much fun, but it was also so difficult, but it also kind of opened our eyes to a lot of like the realities of touring. So we could come back and kind of regroup a little bit and figure out like what was going to be the best way for us. And so we, we spent a lot of years of just doing like short runs and playing a lot of shows in like our area where we could like traveling to like Seattle, Portland, Boise, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just a lot of years of just playing any shows that we could. And then like slowly we we're picking up enough shows that we were able to be a little bit more, more selective. And it just, and thankfully, like at some point, um, well, probably almost like four or five years ago now, um, we signed a management contract with Paul Crosby, um, the original drummer from uh, Saliva. And he's, he's doing it purely as a passion project. Like he's still playing drums. Um, he had stepped away from saliva and now he's playing in a band called cold wards with his son. Um, but like, he really is kind of at a power. He was wanting to focus on sharing some of his experience and helping younger bands, at least like know what they're getting into. And he's been a huge help for us and, you know, getting us connected with some of the festivals and stuff. And now we're, you know, with booking agencies and stuff like that. So it's, it's definitely working with Paul has really opened a lot of doors to help make this a lot easier on ourselves. Yeah. I wanted to ask, uh, you know, cause I saw, you know, how, how that, I saw that you guys were working under him, but like how that, you know, relationship came to be and like how, uh, you know, what, you know, you pretty much ex have, have explained like the experience so far, uh, working mm -hmm. under him. Um, but, yeah, uh, I feel that's the game been, been kind of a huge game changer for you guys. It has. Yes. I mean, and I mean, honestly, the way we started working with Paul is kind of comical because um, we, <laughs> Mitch and I and Scott and stuff like that, were all like really big saliva fans in the early 2000s. Like when Click Click Boom came out, like I can tell you exactly where I was and like who showed me the song and stuff like that. Like it was just one of those kind of like core members of like, this is really awesome. I like this style of music. And uh, so one day Mitch and I had been like doing some stuff for the band and then like we got a message through like our Facebook page and it was like, hey, this is Paul Crosby saliva. I'm starting up like a management thing and basically gave him like a whole sales pitch and stuff. And he's like, I'd love to talk to you guys. I really like what you're doing and love your music and stuff. And then Mitch and I had about an hour and a half long phone call of like, this is, this is, we're being 
punked, right? Like this has got to be a bad finish. Like there's no way this is real. And kind of went back and forth. And finally we're like, okay, well we'll have a phone call. And then like the more we talked to him, we're like, I think this is the real guy. <laughs> and it turns out that when we played Rocklahoma, um, like a year or two previous, like one of the uh, media guys we had talked to, like, you know, just was really enamored with us. And uh, we had a good relationship with him. And Paul had been kind of asking around different people, like, who, you know, who are some of the up and coming bands that he thought um, we, he should be working with. And uh, God bless him. Bulldog was like, you got to check out Silent Theory. Like they're doing some pretty awesome stuff. So that was really kind of how that came together. Nice. And then uh, you, you mentioned uh, Rocklahoma, you know, um, have you guys like, uh, you, you know, had uh, any more experiences with some of those festivals? We have, and I will say it is incredible. Like it, it does, it's a little encouraging because like you get to a festival like that and it's like just so many people who are there with the exclusive purpose of having a good time and listening to good music. And so it's always just a really great kind of uh, positive kind of pot party atmosphere. Like people are just really excited to be with the music. <clears throat> but yeah, we, we played Rocklahoma and then um, we were slated to play Incarceration and then COVID happened and then we were able to like stay on the bill like after everything came back. And so in 2021, we played Incarceration. Um, okay, yeah, I was there then. All right. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. And then this last summer, we just played Rockfest up in Kadat, uh, Wisconsin, and that was pretty incredible. Like I will say the – the biggest thing that really stood out to us, like one, the, the fans are incredible and everybody's having a great time, but the hospitality they put into those, those festivals is just incredible. Like we were a little out of our element, like when we got to incarceration, cause we got there and they're like, okay, here's your trailer. Here's your stuff for craft services. And we're like, okay, great. Thanks. And they're like, and when you're done playing, we have somebody waiting to uh, give you a ride down to a hotel about a mile away where you can take showers and stuff. And then we'll bring you back. And we're like, awesome man <laughs> like thank you <laughs> like yeah. like i don't know it's just like they have everything accounted for they're just like hey whatever you need and we're like absolutely thank you so much so it's, yeah, it's pretty incredible huge huge fan of the danny wimmer festivals myself man i mean i think the top notch uh i i, I and i hear all the you know i never hear anything bad from any of the artists that that play there um and and yeah that was uh what was that like i mean playing that first one because that Usually that's in July, but I believe that year that it came back, it was in September because we are waiting on Ohio to open up. Yeah. You know, it's still fresh after COVID. I knew like usually I'm back backstage with media and stuff, but that year there was none. Um, they finally been like easing back into that. Uh, but what was that first one like, you know, first major festival like after uh, COVID? Um, it was – it was a little weird. It was pretty incredible. Cause like, I don't know, it was one of those, it was very surreal. Um, you know, from like, we got there and we went over to craft services and like, we'd been going back and forth with RJ from uh hailstorm cause he has a podcast or at least he did for a little while. And we were like, he'd reached out and we were trying to get on that. And so like we are over craft services and then just like RJ and a couple of people from, um, from hailstorm come over and just like, Oh, Hey, and start talking to us. And it's just like, this isn't real life. Like, you know, these are, these are bands that we aspire to like, you know, be around and stuff like that. And then they, you know, there they are just talking to us and calling us by name and stuff. And it's like, Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, but it's just, I think the thing I like about those festivals too, is like the, uh, the, f the festival that we played at, like in one day, um, a day to remember played and just, lights out just unbelievable show and then like immediately after that mudvane played their first show in like you know 12 years or whatever and it was just like this is such a cool spectrum of music and i loved every single minute of it like it was just incredible so that was that was pretty neat um, <coughs> yeah and then uh i mean with that that awesome backdrop of uh you know the reformatory there did you get a oh, chance yeah. to, to check it out yeah, we did. Um, went and did the, the little walking tour, and it, it's pretty creepy. Um, and of course, they always set it up for, like, they have the haunted tours after dark and stuff like that. But I don't know. It's pretty cool that that's where they shot uh, uh, Shawshank. Yeah. 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 
It's awesome, man. And then, um, I mean, I remember too with that that festival. Like I said, be, it being fresh and it's like having to deal with the state. You know, waiting for the state of Ohio, uh, to you know relax some of the the sanctions or or whatever. Um, but it's like you ha- either had to be like, you know, uh, tested or you know fully vaccinated, have your cards and all that that stuff, which kind of sucked, but it was like, Hey man, people are tired of being in their houses. Let's do what we got to do to get out and enjoy ourselves. What, uh, you know, although it, it was cool backstage, but I mean, was there still a lot of other, uh, rules in place? Um, yes and no. I mean, thankfully it was open air. So there was a lot of that, that like, you know, if you weren't like standing in big groups, like they weren't like walking around forcing people to put on their masks and stuff like that. So you could step outside and kind of, you know, take the mask off for a few minutes. But um, I, I think the big thing was like, most people were so, to your point, were so like excited to be out of their house and actually at an event that everybody was like playing nice and cooperating and stuff like that. Um, and so that was pretty cool to see that, you know, people could come together. Like, even if they weren't like super excited about it, like they were still like willing to, be a community member so that we could all have this thing. <clears throat> yeah, and what was also beautiful about that time frame, I mean, it was uh, I think the 20 year anniversary of 9/11 that weekend as well. And they did uh, you know, of course Danny Wimmer always, you know, he's very uh supportive of the the military and stuff. Another reason why I have huge respect for him, but they uh, you know, did a little tribute you know, to all those we lost on, on 9-11. And, and then this this uh, young lady came out with this amazing voice and sang the national anthem. And I'm out there, you know, in the crowd, you know, uh, taking it all in. And it was just like, you know, all the divide that, that, that was going on in the country at this time. But I, I saw like, you know, a united, you know, United States of America right there at that music yeah. festival. You could hear a pin drop. There was silence when they said, let's have a moment of silence for those we lost, you know, and then people taking their hats off and hand over their head, heart and everything, you know, when she sang the national anthem, dude. And I felt like, you know, I'm an old uh, retired Navy vet, man. I had a tear running down my eye. I was just like, this is beautiful. This is my this is the America I want to believe in, not the one that the media and everybody pushes all the bullshit on. Not to get us sidetracked on any rabbit holes or, you know, stuff no, like that, but I'm just like speaking about my experience <laughs> there. And I'm glad that you guys were, you know, played that that weekend, you know, and we're a part of that. Um, but yeah, dude, it was it was an amazing time. And luckily, like things have kind of, you know, this this past year at Inc., I was actually, you know, able to do interviews again backstage. So, you know, it's like nice. we're getting back to to normal. So it was it's uh but uh, but we're quick forgetters, I think, in this country. But anyway, like I said, I don't want to get on my <laughs> soapbox. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, the new album uh, you guys just released. T- tell us how it ends. You know, I mean, man, I I, I could I, going on going on the rant I was just on and, and the rabbit holes I'm going down. I mean, I I, I could read so much into that name. <laughs> In itself, but let's let's hear from you. What what's the inspiration behind the name of that album? And and I believe it's uh, is it one of your uh, tracks as well, right? Yeah, we we released a music video for the the title track the same day as the the album, um, and it's one of those like this album in particular. Like you know, we like I said, we've been grinding on this for a long time, and so like this is really kind of a a really definitive spot for us. Like we feel like we've, you know, secured a foothold and have taken a good step forward. Um, our last couple albums we've recorded in the same place with the same producer and all this other stuff. We're happy with those, <clears throat> but we felt like it was time to, you know, try and move out of our comfort zone a little bit and try and take some of those steps to, you know, grow a little bit. Um, we're always trying to better ourselves. And so with this album, we actually worked with a few different songwriters just to, you know, we, we've always wrote, uh, wrote our own songs and everything like that. And that's really important to us, but we also wanted to make sure that like, we felt like we were still doing things the best way possible. Um, and weren't just kind of getting in our own ruts. And so we, we worked with a few co-writes on this album just to kind of, if nothing else, see other people's process and kind of how they approach songwriting, stuff like that, just to, you know, see if there's anything we can learn and take away from it. 
Um, but we also started working with Chris Dawson, who does a lot of recording and uh, mixing and stuff like that. Uh, and he used to play in Seasons After and a few other bands. And so, like, he's familiar with, like, the, the artist side of things. But, you know, he just is able to produce really great results. And, you know, I'd say seven of his ten bands are currently probably playing on Octane right now and stuff like that. So, like, clearly, like, the sound he's producing is, like, more than radio ready and stuff like that. And so um, it was really a great opportunity to work with him and kind of see his uh, approach to recording and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, like a, we never start off with an album name or anything like that. We always kind of like put the songs together and kind of see what the common theme is. Like we, we try not to like pigeonhole ourselves or anything like that. Cause I mean, some people can do that creatively and still do it in a really great way. And I just, I, I feel like if we were like, this is our end goal, like it may just kind of like, you know, take away from the process a little bit. So we always wait till we have our collection of songs and then just kind of like, then discuss like, what do we feel like this is best representing and that kind of stuff. And a lot of the songs had a lot of uh, frustration um, in them. Um, you know, there's, this is still a very definitively silent theory album, but like, I would say like some of the heaviest songs we've ever written around this album. Um, and, you know, we definitely took some chances. There's one or two songs that are a little bit weird, but like are still pretty awesome. So, um, yeah, it just is one of those like the the tone was just kind of like, uh, OK, fine. You know, you know, clearly you think I don't have the answers. Please enlighten me. Like, what, t tell me how it ends kind of thing. Um, and we had had the, the song um, written with that title, of like, tell us how it ends. And we're like, that's, you know, feel like it really encapsulates like how we feel about this. And we'd gone through a couple different like album arts and one of them that we all really liked, but we thought was a little dark, especially with some of the stuff going on in the world today was like basically somebody sitting in a uh, lawn chair with a cooler and a beer. And there's what looks like a nuclear blast off in the distance. And we're like, it's pretty powerful, but also like, I don't know, we don't want people to read into like, you know, what we're trying to get out of this. So uh, we, we ran some, some different options, but yeah, it's, it's really just kind of a, an expression of like, you know, frustration, I guess. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Well, speaking of uh, you know frustration and and expressing yourselves, uh, you know one of the the singles that really caught my attention was uh, "Burn It All Down." Um, Want to share a little bit about the inspiration for that one? Yeah, I mean that is. I mean, first off, it's a really fun song to play, and um, it was kind of a cool opportunity to shoot in that video because um, we've done a few videos with. Uh, Juan Barton has uh, now, and he's he's got this cool setup in St. Louis. Um, he's just got like you know a big like um, a couple of spots in an industrial park, and you just open it up, and he's got like sets built, and he's got like the huge like white wall and green screen, and like he's got a you know, like forty foot LED wall. It's like he's just got a bunch of cool tools at his disposal. But um, that one in particular, <laughs> he was like. Hey, have you seen this new David Fincher film? And we're like, no. And he's like, well, the movie sucks, but the film, the cinematography is amazing. And he's like, and that's kind of what my inspiration is for this video. And so we kind of built this whole concept um, <laughs> around that. But we also were able to work with a VFX company. And so we did a bunch of just shots that at the time kind of felt, felt silly because, like, we're just standing in front of blank spaces, just kind of, like, doing this stuff, hoping that, like, it would – come together and so like all of the shots in that video where it's like outside of the building and moving in and around and like a lot of that stuff is all like uh, CGI that was like custom built after the fact and so that was a new experience for us and it was kind of fun um, but like the song is you know I'm trying to think the best way of putting it because like it is one of those like um, I think it's it's really a statement of like planning your flag like you've been doing what you think are the right things you've been playing the game like whether it's a personal relationship or professional relationship like or just somebody you know like but like and I, I feel like we've all had that experience of like you get to that spot and you're just like nope <laughs> like we're, we're no longer playing this game and uh, I will like I will literally burn everything to the ground before I like you know continue this or whatever so I think that was really kind of the precipice for it. it was just kind of digging your heels in. Nice. I think I knew there was a reason why I was connecting to that song. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I mean, you guys have been been killing it with not only the, you know 
the videos, but the single streaming and everything like on YouTube and Spotify and stuff. What do you, what, what's the secret to getting them numbers? <laughs> um, you know, when it started, I could not tell you, like our first video we ever released on YouTube um, was for our song Fragile Minds. And it just kind of took off and had a mind of its own. We did nothing to or with it because we didn't know what we were doing at the time. We just put it on YouTube and, you know, shared it as best we could. And, you know, now it's got like, I don't even know how many millions of views. It's, you know, over 25 million views now. And it's just, it's crazy. And so that definitely having that kind of that workhorse or that weight, like helps the algorithms, so to speak, because, you know, people will kind of come to our songs through that one or something. But um, I think a big help for us also was a couple of years ago, we signed with a, signed a distribution deal with a company called One RPM. And they have a whole team especially dedicated to like helping promote these songs to like different playlists and stuff like that. Um, Cause you know, sometimes you can organically get on playlists, like whenever stuff gets released, like they can like pick it up and that does happen. Um, but having people who can, you know, know the system and know the people who can just be like, Hey, would you please check this out for me and stuff like that? Nothing's ever guaranteed, but um, you know, being able to have somebody like advocate for you has definitely been a huge benefit for us. Definitely. Uh, one RPM, you guys work with podcasts, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, man, it's that it, everything I've been uh, checking out, man, you know, it's like, I've really been, I've been digging, uh, you know, and uh, you know, before we get ready to wrap up, I want to ask you a couple uh, questions that I normally ask my guests. Yeah. You know, you talked about some of the early influences uh, when you were little Bobby you know, getting into music and stuff. But uh, who are who would you say are your, your current top three musical artists? Um, that is a great question. There's there's a lot of great bands doing great things. Um, I think for me with like the style of music we're playing and just kind of like the performance aspect because we're very much concert fans ourselves. And so like we really do try and put a lot of effort into our live shows because if people are willing to spend their time and their hard-earned money to come see us, like we want to make sure it's not a complete waste of their time. Um, and some of the bands that I think that are really doing that well right now on a big scale are like uh, bands like Nothing More. I think they have an incredible show. Um, Bad Omens, I think, is incredible. Like Noah, just the things he's able to do with his voice are, you know, just insane. Um, but even, you know, back to like a day to remember, like they are one of my favorite bands because they have created a, a world where like they will go on tour with Blink-182 and then turn around and go on tour with somebody like Mudvayne, like, and it, they fit in every time. Like they have the silly pop punk songs, they have like the super heavy songs and everything in between. And they live comfortably in both of those worlds. Um, but yeah, so I think any of those bands that are really coming out and just writing good music and putting a lot of their live shows are the bands that I really, you know, look up to. Nice. And then uh, we're talking about like, you know, planting our our flag for things that we believe in what do you uh you know what class do you feel should be uh mandatory before graduating high school today Ooh, that is a great question um i think one of the the things that gets overlooked a lot in education today because like we've really gotten um and without getting on too much of a soapbox i think we've really gotten into like standardized testing and stuff like that and so like we're, students are learning a lot of really important topics, but I think things like personal finance and like, you know, some of the basic life skill things have kind of gotten overlooked because like those don't, those aren't as sexy on a, a standardized test. But I think, you know, learning how to pay bills and like learning what compound interest is and why it's bad on your credit cards and things like that. Like, um, I think some of that could really be good for up and coming adults. <laughs> Dude, that's like the number one answer I get, you know, it usually involves personal finance and, and taxes. And, uh, you know, it's like, hopefully, you know, if, if one RPM gets behind me, I can get this message out from all you artists, <laughs> you know, <laughs> across the nation. Um, and then who are, who would you say are three people who've inspired you and you can credit for making you the person you are today? Um, that is a great question. I think, um, and this may sound a little cheesy, but um, I think my my dad has taught me a lot about like just hard work and the value of hard work. 
Um, my dad basically had three different careers because he retired from the Navy, worked a, another job for like 16 or 17 years, and then went and worked another job for like 15 years and then finally retired. So like, and he never called out sick, never did any of this stuff. Like it just, you woke up, you worked, took care of the business. Like that's what you did. And so I've, I really appreciated getting those kind of things. Um, my mom, like right, wrong or different is somebody who was very convicted in her beliefs. Um, we don't believe the same thing on a lot of things. We don't agree on a lot of topics, but like, it's just one of those, like she's always been very firm in her resolve on what she feels is right. Um, and then honestly, like my best friend that I've had since high school, um, my buddy, Josh, who is an army vet. And like, we've been through a lot of like good things, bad things, and you know, all this other stuff. But like, he's one of those guys that's always kind of reminded me of the importance of like, just kind of being silly sometimes because life sucks, work is hard. And sometimes you got to just get it out and just do something completely nonsensical just for this, the entire purpose of having a little bit of fun and, you know, not, not letting everything carry on you all the time. <clears throat> I agree. I agree. And on that note, uh, I, I noticed, uh, are those, are those menus up on the wall behind you for Springfield, Ohio or, uh, uh, no. <laughs> uh, so I'm actually like, uh, in my office at my day job. And so those are actually just, uh, old, uh, annuals from like the university. And then I got some sweet cat paintings and stuff. <laughs> I got my. I, know, I was just making a joke about that, but uh, <laughs> those are sweet. You know, since we were talking about you know value of being silly, <laughs> but uh, but speaking of which, here's a new question I'm adding adding to the to the uh, the the mix of questions I like to ask my artists, and you're you're going to be the first one. Favorite conspiracy theory? Oh man, there's so many good ones to to really dive into. Um, Trying to, oh man, um, and I know I'm gonna kick myself later for not coming up with a better one, but um, I don't know. It's really kind of a toss up between like the flat Earth, like ice wall theory, or the uh, mole people, kind of like the one where like if you get up to the poles, you can go down into the Earth, and there's like a whole other like sect of humanoids or whatever that are living inside the, I don't know, some of that stuff is yeah. like, the effort it takes to come up with that and try and make that work, like, and I mean, I'd be the first one to be like, well, gosh dang, I was wrong if it ever turned out to be true, but like, just the, the hoops you have to jump through to make that make sense, and it still never quite does. I've actually had Flat Earth Dave as a guest on this podcast, and it's still to this day my most watched episode <laughs> you know, without the help of one RPM, you know, getting it out there. So I don't know, man. I, I just love talking about these topics. So, um, And then are there any causes or organizations that you support and encourage others to check out? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think I could get behind just about any organization that is supporting children in need, whether that is like clothing or activities and, you know, you know, I, you know, again, without getting too much on a soapbox, like I, I think that like there's a lot of room for growth in, you know, underdeveloped communities and foster care system and things like that. We're like, you know, we, we pr talk a big game about like no child left behind in schools, but then like what happens when they get out, like at 3.30 PM when school day is over, like a lot of these kids are being left behind in different ways and stuff like that. So I think any of those charities that are, you know, helping students that may not have some of those like, access to resources and stuff like that, get those so that they can get to a point in their life where they can make their own decisions, I think is really huge. Damn, yeah, I, I agree, man. And then, uh, you know, any message that you have for our military members that are currently serving overseas? Uh, yeah, um, as a former Marine myself, um, definitely thank you so much for your service. Um, you know, we, we rely on you and sometimes, you know, you know, your, your sacrifice is not always as uh, appreciated as it is, it, you know, sometimes should be. And so we definitely, at least in our band in silent theory, we, we very much like honor and respect the sacrifice that you guys are making, being away from your families and doing what you believe to be right um, to help make a better future for everybody. Awesome, Bob, man, thanks. And, you know, I didn't catch that earlier. I kind of thought maybe just when you're mentioning, you know, 
going in the military a, a, as a kid because of family members that maybe you were the one that didn't go, but hey, Semper Fi, brother. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, graduated I school have, Friday and went to boot camp on Sunday, so. <laughs> no, nice. I, uh, yeah, I, I might have to have you back on for my, my military uh, only uh, episode then, because I, I do, like every five episodes, I interview a veteran about their oh, experience cool. in the military and everything too. So, uh, you know, maybe yeah. I'll have to connect with, uh, you know, I'll, I'll hit Annie up or whatever for your, your info or whatnot and uh, uh, have you back on for, for that episode as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, yeah, awesome to hear, man. And then, uh, you know, for the fans out there that might be new to hearing about Silent Theory and want to support you guys and, and see what you guys are up to, where would you send them? Um, you know, we're, you can find us anywhere the music is streaming or videos are playing and things like that. But, um, a good starting point is going to be silenttheory.com. Um, when you get there, there's, you know, links to our videos and stuff like that right at the top of the page, but there's tour information. Um, you know, we have a merch store. Should you feel inclined to, to, you know, get some sweet gear that way. Um, but there's also links to all of our socials and all of our streaming platforms and things like that. Um, but yeah, especially with, uh, we have a tour coming up here in about a month. Um, definitely swing over and check that out. Cause we'll be hitting, uh, we're starting in Chicago and finishing up in Massachusetts and kind of hitting a little bit of the, um, couple stops along the top of the, the Midwest there. And then we're going to hit a little bit of the upper East coast, um, on this run. So definitely check that out if you're in those areas. Yeah. Isn't Cleveland on that list? Uh, I believe so. Yes. Awesome. Well, then we'll have to connect there, man. Yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> that's where I'm at right now. So. Oh, very cool. <laughs> awesome. Bob, man, uh, you know, it's great talking with you, man. Uh, one last favor before I let you go. Do you mind cutting a promo ID for the show? Just introduce yourself and you're listening to today's boondoggle. Yeah, absolutely. What's up, everybody? This is Bob James from the band Silent Theory, and you're listening to, to today's boondoggle. Awesome. Bob, man, thanks again for your time, brother. I really appreciate it. It's great talking with you. And, uh, yeah, we'll have to connect for that follow-up uh, episode. Yeah, absolutely. All right, man, take care.